Hurry, we're all trying to escape the zoo together, but the zookeeper is after us. Okay, really, Pilfering Pandas is an abstract set collection game, but it still has this adorable panda theme to get you into that panda cooperating mood for up to four. And I didn't know this before, but pilfering means stealing. So you're playing as thieving pandas to get the hell out of this zoo. Let's see what's going on. So our team of pandas is trying to get out of the zoo by moving up this victory point marker all the way up to here. To do that, we're playing sets from our hands. But then if this guy, the zookeeper, ever reaches up to us, he puts us back in our cages and we lose the game. So for these sets, they're played to the central trade area where our buddies, the meerkats, are. You want runs of numbers going up or down, and you can also play matching numbers. A set has to be at least three cards, and once you put down your set, you get points according to the pandas on the cards. Oh, and then anytime you play cards, the zookeeper gets alerted and moves up once. On your turn, you will draw a card from the deck or from this communal hand called the hideout. Draw from the deck. Then you can play as many cards as you want, and then discard a card to the hideout to end your turn. But you gotta hurry because after everyone's turn, the zookeeper gets one step closer to catching us pandas. That's the bare bones of this game. Basically, play as many sets as you can before the zookeeper catches up to you. So now on to the review of Pilfering Pandas. And this is a prototype copy, but we still like a lot of the components. The cards have this bright art where you'll never get confused for all the sets. And look how cute it is. Every single color has a name on it. Really cute. This art style continues with the panda cards that each player gets, where there's a name or names and personality types. Plus, these wooden markers for your progress out of the zoo feel great to hold. So now onto the gameplay, and let's talk about the nuance set collecting. First of all, there's five colors, meaning that it's really unlikely to just get a really strong hand and start playing straights right away. You gotta plan for it. And then this means that you can play five of a kind for big, big plays. But even when you do have a big set, you don't want to jump the gun because this game demands you to be very careful with how your sets are placed. See, once a set is placed, everything in that trade area from now on has to be built off of that last card. So if the last card is a green six, you either have to use that six to make a straight or you have to use that green to play a green card and there's no way to take sets off. So be careful lest you trap your options in the two trade areas. And then remember how the zookeeper always gets alerted and moves up anytime you play cards? This doesn't seem that dangerous because you'll basically always be outpacing that zookeeper, right? But then couple this with how your friends, the meerkats are not always going to be that nice to you. There is a soft limit on how much food you can feed them. Once you place a set to have a total of six or more cards in a meerkat, you turn that last card. And now every time you place there, the meerkats are screeching and hollering. You're still gonna get points if you play there, but then the zookeeper moves up by three spaces with all that noise they're making. Oh God, shut up, God. So the importance of ordering mixed in with these slightly unfaithful meerkats means that on your turn, despite having infinite actions to play cards, you're often weighing whether you should just pass and not play anything at all. Like, you can just play one card to extend a set for one point, but that's a bit of a wash with you getting one point and then the zookeeper one point and then the meerkats are one step closer to getting cranky. So it's often best to just save for big plays, with a big set to extend the meerkats as far as possible past six cards before they start punishing you for more placement. But oh man, you may not always want to just play a lot of cards, because if you empty your hand too early, you get this countdown card, where your team only has 4 rounds left to win. Oh, and then one last thing with the set collecting, those meerkats have a food preference, so if you match that 100%, you get one extra point. Did I mention the set collecting is nuanced? To lead into the great teamwork this game has, we gotta talk about this hideout mechanic, which is like a communal hand your team will constantly be interacting with. Remember, at the end of every turn, you have to discard a card there. And then at the start of every turn, you can draw a card from the deck, from the rightmost card of the hideout, or, which wasn't explained before, you can take as many cards as you want from the hideout. You can even take all of them. This is a crazy tempo swing that is gonna move the zookeeper up by four, but you probably won't care too much because you have all these options to now use. 
Just keep in mind that you always have to play the leftmost card that you picked up, so maybe you don't want to take all the cards. Man, is it satisfying when you're working together to load up this hideout for a couple of turns, and then BAM! You grab that hideout, ramp up the tension with the zookeeper moving up, and then you have 12 or so cards in your hand. Play a big set. Play two big sets. Maybe you can play three. And then you won't panic about the zookeeper going up by four because you've moved up by so much. We also want to praise how the hideout encourages multiple types of approaches. Sure, you may want to go big and then take from it after it slowly fills up again. But sometimes you may just want to take four cards. I know, a tiny amount versus nine, but this is because the hideout refills itself when emptied. So there is merit to take from it early, and then let it refill for more potential resources later on. More nuance with the set collection comes in with this card, the key. Now this is a wild that has real consequences in this game. You can use it as any possible card in a set, but that jangle jangle of keys makes the zookeeper go up an additional two spaces. Something you may want to try is to discard it permanently from the game, which buys you some time by pushing the zookeeper back two spaces. But remember, if you remove this card from the game, that's one less card in your hand. And now, so maybe for your end of turn discard, you have to ditch something that you actually needed. So we teased the awesome teamwork, let's get into how good it really is now. First off, you have to work together, because placing the wrong sets is punishing. But since everyone has hidden hands, there's no quarterbacking at all. There's a lot of communication rules where you can't talk about what's in your hand, but you can talk about everything that's on the board, so discuss away. Really, since there's only one copy of each card, every single draw and discard is giving your team more information on how to create sets. Don't like a draw? Well, that's a card that no one else has. Maybe I'll discard a wild key card to set up my friend. Should you play the last six in the game for your ascending run, or discard it for your teammate so he can make a bigger descending run? Pilfering Pandas wants you to keep communicating, and you're constantly sending signals or bluntly screaming at your teammates not to take that red four you just put down because Emmett over there said he needed it. For efficiency, you probably want some pandas playing the big sets, and then other pandas focus on setting them up. So when you first start the game, you have to figure out who the heck you're discarding cards for, which again is where tons of teamwork is required. This is a great time to mention that even if your team hits the victory point marker, you need one player to empty out their hand entirely to win. So you gotta set up for that. And then the icing on top for the teamwork is that the pandas you're playing as all have abilities. These are once per game triggers that are often that magical boost needed to escape the zoo. There's a good diversity here, like Vian and Rule, who can have the penalty of taking from the hideout. And then our boy Emmett, as mentioned before, who can trade a card with someone else. These are yet another way to spark communication and signal your teammates, as you ask them about their abilities, or if you should use your ability, like say you use Solon to set up the hideout because you know your buddy needs that color. So man, this is a lots of analysis for a small box game. And we want to say that this game is very efficient on how it uses its 15 to 20 minutes. Right off the bat, you'll be looking at your six cards in your hand and the three cards in the hideout. The game never drags because the zookeeper is moving up at the end of everyone's turn. The pressure is really on to escape and you constantly have to balance between setting up for better sets or to say, ah, yeah, we just have to make a play happen or we're gonna lose and then you play a less than ideal set. But at least you haven't lost. And after the game is over, there's replayability to go again and again. There's all these panda abilities to mix and match with your team, and if you really want to add some craziness to the game, you can foil the panda's plans. Foiled again! Okay, okay, these are real event cards that you can hide in the deck and spice up gameplay when drawn like suddenly adding cards to the hideout and then shuffling its order. Even if you don't want to use these foiled cards, your starting hands and hideout will be different and you can bump up the difficulty levels if it's getting too easy. This game also scales pretty well. If you add in pandas to get to that three and four player count, you introduce the eights and nines to the game, which give even more complex set possibilities. The more people you have, the more communication you have to do to win. 
But don't worry if you just have two people, because communication is still mandatory. With two people, you also have to worry about emptying your hand too early, because if you do so, then you're out of the game, and then there's only one other person to take up the slack to win the entire game. At one player, this game has no hidden hands, where instead you manage a dummy hand that you discard from every round. This mode loses out a lot of the fun communication with teammates, but it certainly feels balanced with it introducing a hand limit. There's even a competitive mode included, which is good enough to be a standalone game. You're still using a communal hideout and discarding to it, but you're all deciding when is the best time to take all the cards for yourself for your points. <laughs> now instead of discarding cards to help your buddies, you're keeping track of what sets they're playing to make sure you don't accidentally help them. The fact that this mode ends immediately once anyone empties their hand makes it really tense. There's also some replayability in this mode because the pandas get flipped and then there's more endgame bonuses you can play around with. The awesome part about the competitive mode being bundled in here is that it's really easy to switch between the competitive and the cooperative modes. And if you know how to play one mode, it's really, really easy to learn the other mode. Now for the cons of pilfering pandas. And the first one that comes in is where the rulebook is showing its prototype elements, but these are drafts that are being constantly worked on. So here's just a taste of what we had to go through. The gameplay setup diagram is absolutely tiny and would really benefit from being on the same page as the text that explains it. The rulebook does have a fact, but we want more gameplay examples, like how we were initially confused on how the turn flow was like if you have unlimited actions. And it turns out that passing on your turn is a very acceptable play in this game. On the visual side of things during gameplay, we would have liked to see the Meerkat preference symbols be bigger because they're really hard to see from afar. I don't know if you guys can even see that from there. Those symbols, yeah, they are pretty darn small. That's it for the cons, now it's time for the nitpicks. First, the player aids. These are just really crammed with words and they get the job done, but they're not really too easy to look at and manage because they're double-sided. Double-sided aids is a no-no. If these could be made physically bigger or simplified a lot, it would definitely help newcomers start gameplay. We also found that some of the panda abilities are stronger than others. For example, we have Vian and Rule, which are always good for giving a one-time discount on a hideout grab, which you're gonna do anyways. Versus Alfie, who looks at the top three cards of the deck and can rearrange them in any order she wants. This is nice, but it doesn't give a tangible boost like a discount to the thing you're going to be doing anyways, which is taking from the hideout, which is like the main mechanic of the game. This isn't a big deal because you can tweak your difficulty by just choosing the pandas you want, but just keep in mind that in smaller player counts, especially solo play, playing someone like Alfie is definitely a lot harder than normal. It's almost like Alfie wasn't meant to escape the zoo by herself. Now for the communication rule nitpicks. Yeah, I know we have praised the teamwork a lot, but the thing is, is that it's really easy to accidentally slip and give away hidden information to your teammates. Since you're constantly talking about and pointing to things on the board, you can do a lot of gray area conversation that kind of looks like this. Oh, hey, hey, so, you know, that's a five, and that one's a green card, you know, green. Green's a nice color, right? Yeah, just some food for thought, so keep that in mind. Your turn. Or like this. Oh, man, you know, I see there's two threes on the board, and uh, don't worry about doing anything with those two threes right now, because uh, I think I got you covered on that end, okay? This is really nitpicky, and it kind of boils down to how your group wants to follow the communication rules. After all, the game says you don't have to follow them if you don't want to. But then the question that comes to mind is, well, what communication rules do you follow? Do you just play with 100% communication with your hand like Pandemic, and now it's prone to quarterbacking? Maybe a beginner communication mode where you can only talk about the colors in your hand is good. Or how about an advanced mode where you can't talk at all, but instead you role play as pandas and can only grunt while pointing to cards on the board. Not sure what the win rate for that would be though. The last nitpick is that the theme doesn't really come through here, but then this is an abstract set collection game, so this is super, super duper minor. The rulebook lore says that the meerkats are helping you escape, but like, how? How are meerkats helping pandas escape a zoo? 
But the thing that is easy to imagine are the pandas inching closer to the exit while the zookeeper is hot on their tail. But, but th then the question is, why are the pandas escaping a zoo? This seems kind of like a bad idea. Aren't the pandas in more danger outside on the streets with cars driving around? What if they get hit? Well, at least you don't have to deal with the aftermath of that if you win this game. So now it's time for a tentative score because this is a prototype. Some updated assets will look like that. So anyways, by judging what we have here with our pros and cons, this is going to get a 8 out of 10. It's tentatively great. Pilfering Pandas really hits this cute time efficient balance of being short with lots of teamwork and set building nuance. Every card matters as a zookeeper inches closer to you, and the collective buildup for the hideout boost is great. Suddenly grabbing 8 cards in one turn to make huge plays is this rush of excitement, and then make sure you stuff those meerkats as much as possible before they get full and are harder to trade with. Your panda hideout is really what this game revolves around, and with it, your team will have so many opportunities for big plays. There is no way to really increase your hand size without taking from the hideout because on every turn, you draw a card, but then you have to discard a card. So feel free to just take a bunch of cards from the hideout. Man, like look at that. Just keep in mind that this game is all about cooperative planning. So if you go Rambo and just play sets because they feel right to just you, you will end up losing this game often. And on that end, we do want to say that there will be some games at higher player counts where you don't play more than one set and are instead dedicated to funneling your teammates. This goes hand in hand with how teamwork is the main focus of the game and you're always engaged with communicating even if you aren't playing the sets yourself. The thing that was a little surprising is that for how short this game is, there is quite a bit of mechanics you will have to learn to get this game going. All the card playing nuance just comes through with all of these separate things you have to learn. Don't worry too much though, because they all flow well once you wrap your head around them. It's just another one of those things that despite this cute and cuddly theme, Pilfering Pandas actually has a decent bite. Chances are you've played set collection that is just as short as Pilfering Pandas, but then Pilfering Pandas has a bit of theme and the huge turns where you can empty the hideout. Your brain will just keep thinking on everyone's turn and then of course, just keep talking in the cooperative mode. Actually, whether it be cooperative or competitive, there's a fast game to be had here, and it still packs a punch in terms of decision making. My personal score for Pilfering Pandas is gonna be A, seven out of 10. I have a good time with it. Right off the bat, for how small this game is, it really surprised me on how long these rule books are. But not to worry, the payout was satisfactory on how thoughtful this game requires you to be. So let's start with the co-op, and I'm not a big co-op fan, but I actually have a solid time here. This is because Pilfering Pandas requires you to keep talking without quarterbacking, as everyone has their hidden hands, and I enjoy that a lot. There's tons of talking points on the board, and I can read my teammates' body language, or just listen to their voice comms, as I discard a card they might want. The tension of the zookeeper just continually keeps me on my toes, so that combined with the constant puzzling I'm doing with my hand makes it enjoyable. The feeling of just seeing your friends play big sets is really satisfying to see because teamwork is such a strong element here. Now there isn't a strong incentive for me to go back to the co-op because I have seen all the different panda abilities in a game. But that doesn't mean I won't try this out with family, of which some really like the rummy cube and it's going to be so great to show them the nuance in the set collecting here. Oh, and also, this game has a weird addictive nature where it's so short and tense, and so if I lose in co-op, I just want to keep playing again until our team wins. The thing that was a tipping point to get this to a 7 was the competitive mode. Man, the competitive mode is so fun. It really keeps me engaged as I look at what my opponent is building, what he is discarding, and I'm being really careful about my own discards too. Like, that feeling when you discard a card and then your opponent grabs it right after is some cursing aloud while I make some mental notes on their hand. Thank you so much to our patrons for making videos like this possible. We got John S, Manuel G, Brian C, Clifford H, Aaron W, Max B, Bora, Jeremy M, C, Charlie P, Quinton S, Sam S, Traveler, Ivan Y, Bonsky, Brian D, Jeffrey L, Brandon, Matt G, Peter C, Spinner, Ted, Brian J, Brad G, T, Humble Beard, Mark A, Nathan C, James M, and Evan B. And we got three mad... We got three Mad Lads of Cardboard, we got ZL and Jeff L and John F, and we got one Mad Lady of Cardboard, we got Amy. Thank you guys so much. If you want to check out our Patreon, 
our Patreon. We got our link in the description below. Check it out. There's got a lot of cool perks for you guys and also some occasional playthroughs with playthroughs, game nights with the patrons. So let me know what your thoughts are on site collecting games or of course, any reviews you'd like to see in the future. I'll see you guys next time. Remember to like and subscribe to Shelfside for more board game content. See you guys later. Bye-bye.